For centuries, museum curators allowed normal wear and tear to erase any traces of colour from ancient statues. But now scholars are making a colour correction. By identifying the faded colour pigment on authentic sculptures, archaeologists can paint replicas of the originals. And in doing so, they reveal age-old predispositions about race and aesthetics. Denise McCoskey joins me now. She's a professor of classics and affiliate of Black World Studies at Miami University. And she wrote the book Race, Antiquity and Its Legacy. Good to have you on our show today. Thank you. So tell me, why is this so little known to this day? Because you'd think that whitewashing, some of the most important um, statues in art history, would have been a bigger deal by now. Yeah, so I think it's um, more a case of uh, what people didn't do than what they did do. So the statues survived from antiquity without paint on them. And it's just a matter of people got to enjoy the look of them without paint. And so museums really need to catch up and tell people what they actually looked like. And part of that is because the the bareness of the marble really got caught up in people's ideas about aesthetics and also about race. Um, so there was um, there's an investment now in not correcting the record. So um, are you saying that marble helped scholars whitewash ancient history? Is it too much to say? So I think uh, there is a point in time where the bareness of the marble um, in the late 19th century, people begin to presume that it reflected some kind of racial identity of the ancient Greeks. And understanding that the marble was once painted really uh, corrects that presumption. And it's also an aesthetic judgment. People got used to thinking that the Greeks loved the bareness of the marble. But when you look at the reconstructions, uh, you can see they're actually very interested in the colors. So they don't have an aesthetic attachment to the bareness of marble, nor did they attempt to use the whiteness of marble as any kind of skin color indicator. So hold on, are you, like, from what you're saying, are you telling me that Julius Caesar, for example, wasn't a white guy? Um, I, I, what I'm saying is we don't really know what his skin tone was, and that's pretty significant because it just didn't matter in the world of antiquity. He would not have understood any kind of sense that his identity was derived from his surface appearance. He understood himself first and foremost as Roman, and Romans came in all kinds of shades and colors. So that was really not um, how he defined himself or how the Romans would have. So uh, it's how we think of race that has changed, I reckon. Well, it really, the rise of classics as a professional academic field is happening in the 19th century, just as modern ideas of race are taking shape. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, when people really get invested in thinking about skin color and especially thinking about um, the so-called superiority of whiteness and the Greeks and Romans get caught up in that narrative and suddenly become used as the paradigmatic of white civilization, um, as the founders of Western civilization. And that has all sorts of meanings that have been hard to disassemble. But it's really important to note that that would have had no impact on them. It's not something that they would have recognized um, in their own time, that they were either white or that they were uh, establishing something called Western civilization. It's just unimaginable from their viewpoint. So Denise, did people actively try to whitewash history? Was this racism? So I think they didn't remove painting from the statue. I think, you know, the, the color has worn off over time. I think what happened is when science started to catch up or when they started to observe the paint on statues, they didn't talk about it. So I think in that sense, you could say that there has been a suppression of that knowledge, um, but it only sort of accumulates over time because a lot of the, the work on the coloring of the statue really does involve scientific analysis. And if it shaped up differently, do you think the art history in Europe would have been uh, shaped up differently and um, would we see different, you know, um, paintings now with more color, perhaps? Uh, I think that's right. I think that um, there's a sort of artificial valuation of Greece and Rome and they've been established to be at the forefront of defining what we consider to be fine art. And so if we go back and reevaluate the fact that we're reading them wrong, I think it really will unsettle a lot of what we think and value in art. And it will also, I think, force us to confront the strangeness of Greece and Rome. So we no longer think of them as mirrors for people today, but we understand how different they were and what it meant to them to be located within this really diverse world of the ancient Mediterranean. So I think it has 
us the opportunity, if we think about color, um, to really unsettle a lot of what we think about the Greeks and Romans, and therefore what we think about ourselves. What we think of ourselves today. For example, the journal Plus One recently had a study, uh, and they found out that more than 80% of artists featured in major U.S. museums in uh, permanent collections are white. So do you think this is the legacy of our mis uh, perception about the racial makeup of Europe? I think that that's right. And I think sometimes it cloaks itself in an aesthetic judgment. So people say, um, you know, the marble, it looks so beautiful because it's bare. But I think we're really only coming to start grappling with the ways in which there's been an implicit idea about race within that. And so I think until we confront that, uh, we're not really understanding all of the investments we have in the ways that we view fine art, in the ways we think about what is beautiful, uh, in the ways that we think about the Greeks and Romans. Denise Makoski, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you very much.